Good morning and welcome to the eighth meeting of the European and External Relations Committee in session five. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers during the meeting should ensure that they're switched to silent. We have received apologies from Jackson Carla. And our first item of business today is an evidence session on the implications of the EU referendum for Scotland. I'd like to welcome to the meeting Michael Russell, Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland's Place in Europe, and Frank Strang, Deputy Director of External Affairs with the Scottish Government. Thank you for attending today, and I'd like to invite Mr Russell to make some opening remarks. Thank you, convener, and thank you for your invitation to come to speak to you this morning. Following the referendum, the Scottish Parliament mandated the Scottish Government to have discussions with the UK Government, other devolved administrations, the EU institutions and member states to implore, explore options for protecting Scotland's relationship with the EU, its place in the single market and the social, employment and economic benefits we all draw from that. This mandate resembles much of my own job description. In the role, I'll focus on engagement with the UK Government and other devolved administrations, with Fiona Hislop leading in Europe. I'll consider all options for Scotland's future place in Europe and will engage with stakeholders to understand their views in order to better inform the Scottish Government's negotiating position. Of course, I should say at the outset, it remains the Scottish Government's view that full membership of the European Union is the best outcome for Scotland. We campaign for that outcome because all the evidence shows EU membership has brought substantial and tangible benefits to all of Scotland and the UK. It has been the best way to tackle complex challenges like inequality, climate change and global security, together with our European partners. It has also brought peace to our continent after two world wars. <clears throat> That's why I agree with the European Parliament's President, Martin Schulz, who said at the LSE in London last Friday, the best possible deal with the EU is membership of the EU. But then he went on to add that any other arrangement necessarily entails trade-offs. Uh, Scotland now finds itself in the position of possibly being pulled out of the EU against its democratic will. It is in a position to have to consider imposed trade-offs. My job is to support the First Minister in considering all options in those circumstances. Now, to do so, we first got to gather as much evidence as possible to choose which option best protects Scotland's interests and measure all those options against the five tests outlined by the First Minister. The evidence we receive will come from policy analysis within the Scottish Government, from the Standing Council in Europe, and of course our engagement with stakeholders up and down the country. Just yesterday, uh, Keith Brown and I met with the Japanese Consul General and Japanese business leaders working in Scotland. The committee is playing a vital and important role in this, of course. Only six days after the vote, you took evidence from my colleague Fiona Hislop. Since then, you've worked through the summer recess to gather views, have issued a wide-ranging call for evidence, and have published a first report on the impact of Brexit. The Parliament is vital to the whole process too. It has to assess the impact of the referendum and to consider uh, options. The Scottish Government is therefore holding a series of debates to give members of Parliament the opportunity to discuss the impact on all sectors of Scottish society. And the Parliament's devolved powers and to bring forward ideas. And I'd urge all the parties and every member to take part in them. The First Minister has also asked me to meet the party leaders to get their input, and I hope to do so shortly. Convener, let me mention one key issue before I close. Last week's debate in Parliament on the economy highlighted the importance of membership of the single market to Scottish businesses and individuals. Scottish companies depend on the single market for trade. Seafood companies depend on common regulatory systems to ensure their product meets the strict hygiene standards in their key markets in Western Europe. Our engineering exporters can send their goods throughout the single market without any border formalities and source components at the keenest prices in integrated supply chains. Many of our companies, especially in the digital technologies, hospitality, food and drink and engineering, depend heavily on EU labour for skills and knowledge. Those are just a few examples of how membership of the single market is vital to Scotland's prosperity. However, the benefits of membership extend far beyond the economy. To quote Martin Schultz again, it's a community with a shared destiny, a model of society, not an accountant's club. That means together we share values and solidarity, as well as the economy. And leaving this community of values would have a wide-ranging impact on our society and identity, which we need to consider carefully. Finally, as regards my engagement with the UK Government, you'll be aware of the first meeting with the Secretary of State for exiting the EU on the 15th of September. It was a cordial and detailed meeting which laid the groundwork for discussion. 
I'm happy to explore further with the committee what structures for formal engagement we're trying to put in place. I hope to be able to confirm soon, along with the UK and other devolved administrations, how this engagement will work in practice. And the letter you received uh, at convener yesterday from the First Minister takes the matter a step forward. I hope this gives you a good overview of my new role. This is, of course, the beginning of an ongoing engagement with the committee as events unfold over the coming period. I'm therefore looking forward not just to answering your questions today and hearing your thoughts, but also doing so on many future occasions. Thank you very much, Mr Russell. Can I open by asking if you could elaborate a little bit on your meeting with Mr Davis, for example? Did you get any indication as to where the UK government was in terms of developing its position on its future relationship with the EU? Um, I, I think it is clear that they have, the UK government has indicated uh, publicly, of course, that they do not intend to trigger Article 50 this year. So we are in a period of preparation. I think that's uh, how I, I think generously I would describe it. I think it is also clear that a, a lot of work is going on in doing sectoral analysis, as indeed we are undertaking sectoral analysis. I made an offer to David Davis to work jointly with the UK government on that. The Permanent Secretary has made that offer to the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, it hasn't yet been taken up, but I hope we could do some work together on sectoral analysis. I believe that we also have to do geographic analysis. I think not just uh, Scotland and England, but actually throughout Scotland, there will be a regional and local dimension to the impacts of, of Brexit. Uh, in terms of the detailed policy position, I have to say I didn't get any firm indication, but I think uh, the conversation confirms what we are all reading and hearing, which is there is a very strong view that freedom of uh, movement is not acceptable to the current UK government, a matter which would cause great concern in Scotland. In terms of the structures that you're putting into place with uh, the, the UK government, we, we know that obviously there is the GMC and we've received a letter from the First Minister to say that there's going to be one takes place in late October. Uh, we have taken a, a variety of evidence from expert witnesses talking about the perhaps the lack of effectiveness of the GMC in the past. And I know that the First Minister herself said that she felt that there needed to be something, something extra in terms of the, um, the intergovernmental machinery uh, to allow Scotland to have the uh, full voice that the Prime Minister promised us when she came to Edinburgh in July. Are you, how do you feel about the way the intergovernment machinery is, is being built? Or is it being built? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, there is certainly an attempt to build it, and the First Minister's letter reflects the fact that that process is ongoing. It's been slower than any, uh, certainly anybody in Scotland would have wished, but it, it's ongoing. I think we should step back and, as Professor McEwen will have indicated to you, look at the intergovernmental machinery. And it is in need of, of much maintenance and considerable change. There have been a whole range of reports on the intergovernmental machinery uh, ever since devolution took place. I mean, just to look through one or two, the House of Lords Select Committee on the Constitution looked at it last year. The Scottish Parliament Devolution Further Powers Committee looked at it. The House of Commons Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee looked at it. The Institute for Government looked at it, the Centre of Constitutional Changes looked at it, and all have come to similar conclusions that this is not really fit for purpose. So if the JMC structure is to be used, then it has to be reformed and focused, and certainly that is the burden of our discussions, and it certainly was a, an issue I raised with David Davis. We have to have a structure that will work and that will allow, I think, two key issues to emerge. One of them would be uh, the way in which there would be an agreement on issues, so you know, the, the JMC has never worked in that way before. It's been a, a, a consensus meeting with an agenda set by the UK government, usually. Uh, and the second one is an oversight of what is taking place on the negotiating side. So those two words are important. We need to use those words to describe what we're trying to seek. We're trying to get an effective structure that will work for Scotland. It would be inconceivable, in my view, if major items of devolved competence were, uh, did not involve the Scottish Government in negotiation. Right. Some of the evidence we took, um, for example, from Mr Pown uh, last week suggested that uh, the devolved uh, governments were really not going to get the kind of 
uh, involvement that they had asked for, that they were going to be treated as consultees in the same way as a stakeholder would be treated. How can you ensure, or can you ensure, that the Scottish Government is not treated just as a consultee, but is actually involved in agreeing the UK's negotiating position, which is what Theresa May promised us in July? Our objective is to secure the full engagement and the full involvement that were promised by the Prime Minister. I'm sure the Prime Minister is a, a, a woman of her word. Uh, that is what she offered. That is what the Scottish Government wishes to achieve, and that's what we're going into discussion to achieve. Thank you very much. Um, going, going forward, I don't know if you're aware of the evidence that we took last week from the Government of Quebec's representative in London, where he talked about during the CETA uh, deal, the provinces of Canada were uh, at the table in negotiating the deal and that wasn't part of the Canada's constitution, uh, but it was insisted upon by the EU. What does that tell you about the potential for Scotland in the up and coming negotiations? I was fortunate enough to have a, a, a meeting subsequent to your committee with Monsieur Siros, and we discussed this in some detail. I think it's important to, to recognise, without diminishing that example as a useful one for us, that because of the federal competencies, uh, some trade issues are reserved to uh, the provinces. So in order to get the comprehensive deal that the European Union was seeking to get, they had to involve uh, the, some of the provinces because otherwise they couldn't make the deal stick. You know, it, the, the federal government could not negotiate on behalf of those federal those provinces. We don't have exactly the same situation in devolution, of course. You know, technically, the U United Kingdom Parliament is still sovereign in that regard. What it does, however, is tells us that in a modern democracy, there should be the opportunity for that type of participation. And therefore, I hope that the United Kingdom government are taking to heart that lesson. And I'm sure the EU are looking at it with interest to make sure that uh, they, they want to see the negotiation discussion involving all those who have an interest. You know, if you look at the situation in Belgium with the devolution there, where devolved competencies allow the Belgian uh, devolved administrations to make international agreements and treaties, something, incidentally, that Gordon Brown uh, referred to in his uh, recent contribution on this matter and said it's a matter he expressed a view that's something that Scotland should have. So those are issues we need to bring into the discussion. And obviously, the, we're up against time here. How, how quickly do you think you're hopeful of getting an agreement with the UK government? I get up every morning hoping that we'll make progress on this, and I'm going to go on doing that until we get that progress. You are absolutely right, convener. You know, the clock is ticking, and we have to make sure that we get that agreement. It's not just us, of course. There's a Welsh and the Northern Irish have to be part of that as well, and those discussions involve Welsh and Northern Irish ministers, and I've been having uh, discussions on the telephone with, with individuals, and I will continue to do that, and we'll meet with them too. <coughs> I invite questions from uh, Stuart, Stuart McMillan and then Lewis MacDonald. Okay. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Minister. Just in terms of uh, Scotland's uh, options, uh, what do you consider uh, actually would be a viable option or any viable options? available for, for Scotland uh, to seek a differentiated relationship with the EU? Well, I think we have to bring our tests uh, that we have to any option. I, don't, I think it's far too early to say what that option is. You know, the, the Parliament asked the Scottish Government to look at the options. Uh, those options are being examined. The, uh, clearly, the Standing Council uh, is deeply involved in that task. And I think you've also had a note from me yesterday of the second meeting of the Standing Council so that you see the work that's being done. Um, so let's just remind ourselves, if we might, about the tests which are important that the First Minister laid out at his speech in the IPPR on the 25th of July. Uh, we have to make sure that our democratic interests are respected. That's the need to make sure our voice is heard and our wishes respected because of the result of the referendum. Our economic interests, safeguarding free movement of labour, access to the single market, membership of the single market. Um, uh, interest in social protection need to be borne in mind. Our interest in solidarity, that's the need to recognise the importance of independent nations coming together for the common good. And our interest in having influence. And that's a particularly important one. For example, if you look at the financial sector, uh, it, you know, the financial sector looking at its needs uh, and looking, for example, at an EEA model would be concerned that they might have regulation without participation. You know, which, given the nature of the financial sector, would be undesirable for them. So those five tests have to be brought to the table when we are considering any of the options, and that's the process we're engaged in now. Certainly, I think one of the things that uh, the EU has managed to do over the years 
uh, is be flexible uh, when considering uh, some of the, the countries and uh, territories. And you consider the situation that the Isle of Man has actually got. E the Isle of Man is not a member of the EU, uh, but the Isle of Man uh, is actually part of the EU VAT area. Uh, and after the referendum, uh, certainly the, the Isle of Man, uh, they, they're part of the Protocol 3 relationship with the EU, which allows free trade in manufactured goods and agricultural products. So certainly the EU has got that opportunity uh, to provide that flexibility where, uh, where it actually has that particular agreement with, elsewhere, with uh, particular uh, countries or territories. And in, in terms of that particular example, do you think uh, that's something that Scotland should certainly uh, consider, uh, particularly with the uh, discussions it has with the UK government and also uh, any external discussions? Yeah, the British Irish Council um, is playing a role in considering some of these matters, and of course the Isle of Man and, and the Channel Islands are members of the BIC. Uh, and the British Irish Council, at its meeting in November, will look further at these issues. So there's discussion going on, but I would just go back to the five tests, you know, just to, if you look at the example of the Isle of Man, in my mind, it probably wouldn't pass the test of influence, it wouldn't pass the test of social protection, it wouldn't pass the test of democracy. But those are issues for discussion. I mean, I, I think we should be very open to discussion of a whole range of possible options. Uh, we should also be, be keen to see evidence-led policy. Uh, as I said on um, Tuesday in the parliamentary debate, when we come to this, those who are concerned, those who have worries, those who also come to it with a more positive uh, view, need to bring evidence to the table to support their view, and that needs to enter into consideration. There's a huge amount of information flowing about we've got to have a rational approach to it. And that is the five tests, it is the basis of evidence, and it is building our understanding of what is also possible. I just, the Italian Prime Minister has a, a lengthy interview with the BBC today, uh, and one of the points he makes is that it would be unreasonable for any uh, negotiated settlement to give a, a party who was leaving the EU a better deal than existed even for existing members, let alone others who are outside the EU. And I don't think we should underestimate that position. That is something that is being heard right across Europe. And there are people you know, who have existing deals, such as the Norwegians, who might be concerned that a new deal would disadvantage them. So there are, it's a very complex process. Uh, and in terms of, uh, you mentioned the British Irish Council, but in terms of the other discussions uh, with uh, the devolved administrations, uh, how are these discussions progressing? Um, discussion is taking place and there's a common interest to make sure, first of all, that we have a robust mach machinery for discussion and negotiation within these islands. We have a common interest in securing that. I actually, I think there's a common interest of the UK government in securing that. Um, and then, obviously, each of us will bring to the table our particular concerns. Uh, you know, the, the, in Northern Ireland, there are concerns of the single market, and particular concerns with the border, uh, and the need for a, 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 you know, a, an open border in Northern Ireland. Uh, well, the Welsh will bring different concerns to the table, but I think we will all endeavour to work constructively and well. And you know, I do I do make it very clear we're going into this in good faith, uh, and we'll do that with the devolved administrations of the other countries, as we'll do it with the UK government. Uh, and finally, can be enough, just uh, what discussions. Uh, has the Scottish Government had attached with uh, the Department uh, for International Trade uh, on the preparations uh, that it's undertaking in relation to the negotiation of the UK's position within the World Trade Organisation? Keith Brown has met um, uh, Liam Fox, I understand, and uh, we are endeavouring to understand the position of the Department. It is not perhaps easy to understand that position. If you read Liam Fox's speech to the WTO in Geneva, um, it's a bit confusing, but we continue to endeavour to understand the position. Uh, uh, Richard Lockhead made a contribution to the debate on Monday about the customs union, which should be borne in mind. Uh, that's a, a, an issue that's not much talked about, but it's very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lewis MacDonald? Yes, and following on really from some of the debate that we had earlier this week on the rural economy, but raising some wider questions, I was um, very struck by the fact that the government's approach in, in, in the last couple of weeks has been focused on membership of the single market, and, and that phrase was used very uh, specifically. Now, as we discussed on Tuesday, the membership of the single market is, is contrary to what has been said by, by some, is, is, is a substantial, a real thing. Uh, membership of the single market comprises the 28 members of the European Union, plus Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein. That's a, a membership organisation with specific rules uh, and uh, specific exclusions. And the question I, I put to you on Tuesday, which I'd be interested in a, 
a, a fuller response on uh, uh, to today is what is the developing view of the Scottish Government about membership of the single market because uh, it does not include, for example, agricultural products or agricultural policies, or nor does it include fisheries, nor does it include customs, nor does it prevent um, uh, uh, Norway, for example, from external trade negotiations. So the position of saying that the Department of International Trade is saying that we need to work within World Trade Organization's rules is correct, and it's perfectly possible to be a member of the single market and to negotiate your own trade rules with third parties. So I'd be very interested uh, to know what the government's view is on both the opportunities but also the limitations of the single market. We would clearly... The EEA is a, 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 it comprises sovereign states. So there is an issue in there at the very start of the matter. It might not be an insuperable issue, but it's an issue in there. Um, it's very, it really is too early to say where that lies in the spectrum of options, because we don't know the UK government's view of what that might be. Uh, as I said to you, and I thought it was a very good question, and I, I repeat that, Mr MacDonald, I think it's important that's the type of question that we need to consider. There are elements of the Scottish debate, uh, the fishing element, for example, uh, who might find uh, EEA membership to be uh, very acceptable, except that it might not assist them in terms of exporting their products. Uh, and therefore, it might be a, a mixed blessing to them, because it does, as you say, exclude fisheries, excludes agriculture as well. Um, there are others, and I mentioned the financial sector, who might find this less than optimum because they would not participate in the regulatory structure. Some prefer the EEA model to a Norwegian, uh, to a Swiss model, because it's dynamic, uh, because it changes with the EU, it, and whereas a Swiss model consists of 100 and I can't remember the exact number, Michael Keating no doubt can remember the exact number, there's the exact number of treaties, uh, which all have to be updated constantly. You know, so there's, there's a huge number of officials flying all in the air all the time, uh, building up these treaties. So there are advantages to it, there are disadvantages to it. That's the type of work that is being undertaken, to examine that, to talk to experts on it, to listen to people who know the system. And that is, of course, all taking place. Um, a, a wide variety of conversations and a great deal of reading is taking place. Um, during the process of negotiation within these islands, that will clearly be a matter that needs to be looked at closely. Uh, a lot would depend upon the position of the UK government took on that in its negotiations when they start uh, with the EU, because you know, the Article 50 negotiations deal not simply with exit, but with framework. So, but th there would also be others to be consulted. You, know, you would have to join EFTA. So the EFTA members would have to accept, for example, a UK membership, and then you know, there would then have to be a discussion with the EU to move into EEA membership. We should also remember that EEA membership was designed for, that hasn't always been, a, 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 a halfway house on the way into the EU. It's not been used, now sometimes it's become a static um, halfway house, but it's never been designed for people on their way out, and that is another issue to be borne in mind. There is a great deal to be discussed, and this committee will be an important part of that discussion, but we are a very long way from a conclusion on that. And one of the, the limiting factors in this discussion presently is we don't actually know anything about the UK government's view on this. I think we can discern from the language on uh, free movement of labour that membership of the single market, whether or not uh, David Davis is slapped down by Theresa May for saying it, is probably not on the table for them but it's something that should be on the table for us. And I, I would stress that. This is negotiation and discussion. And we therefore have to come to the table with what we believe to be the things that are in our best interests and to discuss them. And there is no doubt in my mind, and certainly no doubt in the minds of my colleagues, that uh, full membership of the single market is short of being a member of the EU is the best option. And I've given some examples there, but there are many other examples we could talk about. That's a very helpful answer, but I think implicit in it, and, and particularly in, in, in what you said there, there at the end, is the suggestion that the Scottish Government's view is that it's possible to be a member of the single market without being a member of the European Economic Area. And, and so I'm keen to understand that. The European Economic Area, as you say, was originally a product of EFTA, but countries like Iceland and Norway have no active uh, intention to turn membership of EFTA into membership of the European Union. So, so it is... A, a, a standing arrangement, and I'd like to understand whether you think it's possible for either, either the United Kingdom as a whole or parts of the United Kingdom, such as Scotland, to have a different relationship 
with the single market that could be described as membership, other than membership of the EEA? That, is, that appears to be the view, insofar as one can, I keep using this word, discern it, insofar as you can discern it from the UK government, that appears to be their view. Many people do not believe that to be possible. But I would stress something that Stuart McMillan said. Uh, you know, there is there's a flexibility in arrangements that we have seen over the years in negotiation with the EU, and that may be possible. So I'm not pouring any cold water on it, but I think uh, we're in the realms of degrees of probability, uh, and the degree of probability in that is probably quite limited. But we don't know. I mean, it is quite important to say in these discussions from time to time, we are unaware at the present moment of what the UK's position on this. If, as appears to be the case, and, and this was clear from the Vidigrad group after the Bratislava summit, that free movement is an absolute sine qua non, then it would not, in my view, be likely that the UK would have anything to do with that. There's discussion of free movement. I notice again today discussion of free movement within sectors. You know, and I think that becomes very, very strange, um, you know, because you're talking about free movement for bankers. You know, and, and I think that there would be some resistance, even, even in the Conservative Party, <coughs> to that being a, a negotiated settlement. The, the Swiss, of course, are trying to negotiate on free movement on the basis of job offers, you know, given their referendum outcome. And again, that's not been accepted as yet. Can I take it from that, finally, that, um, and, and you've helpfully provided a note of the meeting, but one which doesn't contain a great deal of detail, I understand why that is the case at this juncture. Can I, can I take it that you have not uh, ruled out or come to a view on the variety of possible ways of maintaining membership or access to single Absolutely correct. And, yeah, and it, is, it is early days to do that, but the clock is, of course, ticking. Thank you very much. I'd like to bring in Rachel Hamilton. Mr. Russell, uh, the Treasury has guaranteed to back EU funded projects signed before this year's forthcoming autumn statement. Agricultural funding currently provided by the EU will also continue until 2020. This is obviously given reassurance to uh, farmers and crofters. However, thinking about Scotland specifically, how do you think the Scottish Government can give reassurance to Scottish farmers in areas that are devolved with regards to agricultural funding, in particular Pillar 1 funding? Well, insofar as we are able to do so, we do it on the basis of the financial guarantee. <coughs> there has to be a financial guarantee, otherwise it couldn't be done. I would be very happy to give that reassurance in a permanent way by saying we're going to stay. You know, that would be the ultimate reassurance. But because we can't do that, then we give the reassurance in the, the financial way. What worries me is not the reassurance that's been given at the present moment, it is what hasn't been given. And I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, Pillar 2 reassurance it has not been given. Um, there is very considerable concern, you know, throughout Scotland, or be in the south of Scotland for you, certainly in Argyll and Butte for me, about leader funding and the pressure on leader funding and the fact that now, if you haven't got a application in that's likely to be ready to be approved before the autumn statement, you're not going to get it. So that money which supports our rural areas, and indeed <coughs> in Scotland, a lower amount of money than we should have had in the e negotiations, which Mr. Lockhead can give you the chapter and verse on, as I can I, as can I, because together we were involved in that in the in 2007 when uh, the, the pillar two was being negotiated. In those circumstances, we have an enormous pending problem in rural Scotland, where a great deal of good work um, being done in rural development, vitally good work, will not take place. So I would like to be able to guarantee all those things, but we need the reassurance from the Treasury that we can do that. And unless we get that reassurance, it simply cannot happen. Now, in terms of stability of policy, you know, I'm very happy and we're planning to talk in detail to the NFU. We will talk to other farmers. We will talk to the Crofters Union. We will have those conversations and we will do, as we're doing across every sector, offer every guarantee we can. But we can't do it without money and therefore the money guarantee has to come from the Treasury. And so what messages will you take to the UK government when you next meet and discuss uh, the, the, the reassurances that you want to give to the, to the Scottish agricultural industry? For heaven's sake, be sensible. Realise the risks within this matter. Don't go around whistling in the dark, which has been a tendency, unfortunately, and say, put the money on the table and help us to make the guarantees that we want to make. That would be my message. And if you would like to take that to your colleagues in London, I would be very grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ross Greer. Thanks. Um, on the issue of, of funding guarantees, uh, when will the Scottish 
government be able to uh, guarantee the funding status for EU students for uh, the years 2017, 18 and 18, 19? Because uh, we've seen uh, in, ed in the Education Committee there were concerns raised by the sector about <coughs> the level of uncertainty here. And as it's an area of devolved competency, it's one that we can give assurances from here. Obviously, that is a matter that's under active consideration. I can't say any more than that. You know, John Swinney is a person that will, in the end, be able to make that decision. Uh, clearly, it is a decision for him. We were able to do it for this year. Uh, obviously, we, are, we would want to see what was possible, but I can't give you a definitive answer at this stage. Okay, Emma Harper. Um, thank you, convener. Um, there's been talk about like access to the free market versus um, membership off, and and Lewis Macdonald has, you know, um, I guess identified that as well. I've had many constituents ask me what's the difference, and there's all these terminology going around with EEA, EFTA, WTO options, things like that. Just wondering if you can maybe define that a little bit for us. Yeah, I, we have to demystify. Uh, this whole business. It is a very complex business and it's full of, of acronyms of one sort or another. Somebody described it to, to me the other day as trying to play three-dimensional chess inside a Rubik's Cube. You know, it is a very complex business. We have to say some simple things to people. The first simple thing to have to say is that you know, Scotland voted to stay and that was a sensible decision uh, you know, because economically this is a very risky set of propositions um, and it's not enough simply to, to go out and say everything's going to be fine. You know, that, that, there's no proof of that. Uh, secondly, we need to explain to people that uh, in order to continue to benefit from, and we should be quite honest that we have benefited from membership of the EU, you know, this has been a beneficial activity, in order to continue to benefit from it, uh, there are some things that uh, Europe insists that we do. Uh, and those things are about having a fair a system of fair trade, fair competition. You know, and it, obviously it's unfair if you can cut, uh, undercut people on labour costs and social protections. So there is a fairness across Europe, and that's what the single market really is. It's taking down the barriers to competition, and it's saying this is a fair competition. And that's why what appears to be you know, sometimes a regulatory burden is actually about just making sure that fairness is observed. So um, I, I hope that individual MSPs are engaging with, as they are, their communities, their constituencies, their regions, their stakeholders, and simplifying their message, but listening too. Because I'm, I, I think we should all be listening to those who say we've got problems and those who say we've got possibilities. I'm very happy to hear both evidence-based cases that say this is what we should do next. So um, it may well be that it would be useful for this, well, this committee is looking at information flow and there is now a SPICE uh, information bulletin. Uh, it may well be that we should find a way to provide some information that was, uh, MSPs could use in their regions and constituencies, and I'd be happy to look at that. We'll take that away and look at it if that's helpful, and see whether we could provide you with some information that could help you to do that. Okay. And in addition, uh, the... It looks like, I mean, are we potentially heading for a hard Brexit? I know people are talking about that. All these negotiations, are they going to affect, obviously, a, our ease of access to the markets? And are we heading for a world trade option for, and how does that impact Scotland? Well, insofar as we understand what the world trade option is, uh, and insofar as we understand it perhaps slightly better than the Secretary of State for Trade, um, it, it is immensely problematic. You know, you've got a far not larger number of people to deal with, many of, some of whom could create difficulties about uh, certain, any aspect of trade. I mean, this could be a, a nightmare of, of, of negotiation. Uh, it is not correct to say that you would simply passport all your existing tariffs into the new situation. Those tariffs aren't simply a, a, a list of, 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 of percentages. They're also, in many cases, based on the quantum of the European market. So you would have to actually work out the quantum and how much you were taking away and how much you were going to allow. It's immensely complicated. Um, I think the, the discussion of hard and soft Brexit is sometimes misleading. You know, it implies, I think, that there is, at one end of the spectrum, people who are actively working for the softest of landings, and at the other end of the spectrum, people are working for the hardest of landings. I don't think in, I don't see in the UK government these people working for the softest of landings. I think it's incumbent upon us and others to argue the strong case for the signal market, for example, because I don't hear it being articulated you know, within the UK government. I think within the UK government, probably the discussion is about the degree of hardness. 
Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, if I could come in on a supplementary of that. In, in our, um, in our away day at Strathclyde University, um, we had a briefing from uh, David Wilson, who is formerly of the Scottish Government and is now an academic at Strathclyde University. One of the issues he pointed out to us about future trading relationships was that these discussions, discussions about future trading relationships, informal discussions about future trading relationships, and indeed when we move there, if we move there, formal discussions with uh, third party countries uh, will be conducted without any Scottish input whatsoever, uh, because obviously trade is a reserved issue. How on earth can we protect Scotland's interests and uh, interests of Scottish sectors in these trade negotiations when we're nowhere near the table? Well, uh, let's, let's, let's start from where we are. You know, we're negotiating where the table is and, 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 you know, and what presence we have at it. So I think it would be wrong to say at this stage that that's what's going to happen. That would be a warning about what might happen. But I think we should be very aware of that. We should apply the five tests to all the options. And implying the five tests to that option where we would accept a, a position which we had no involvement would fail the democratic, economic, social protection, solidarity and influence tests. So it would be unacceptable to us in its entirety. Uh, you know, and we would have to make that very clear and negotiate on that basis. Uh, we, Something, we, for example, that Keith Brown would have been saying when he met <coughs> Liam Fox. Indeed, and it's something I will be saying on, on I'm sure, on many future occasions. Uh, you know, we, we have to be very clear how devolution, even devolution as we have it now, changes the way that things are done. You know, if, if this uh, Brexit had taken place before 1999, before 1997, there would have been no structure in which Scotland's voice could have been heard apart from the existence of the Secretary of State. There is a formal structure, devolved structure, this structure which has been empowered on two set, three more occasions since devolution was established. We, this is a dynamic process of devolution, and we have to be in there arguing very strongly that our voice is not just to be heard, we are part of the process of negotiating this. It just strikes me that the people you're negotiating with, do they understand that? For example, David Davis, I believe the last time he was in government was with John Major's government pre-devolution. Um, similarly, Liam Fox was actually against devolution and uh, Boris Johnson has never been seen as particularly friend of Scotland either. Um, so you're dealing with people who perhaps, um, even in conservative terms, aren't quite up to speed uh, with the devolution settlement, do you think that's a fair comment? Uh, yeah, I think it's a fair comment. I mean, there are people sitting in this parliament who are against devolution, so you can, the leopard can change its spots. Um, but in addition, I'm sure that uh, the full information weight of the civil service is being brought to bear on briefing ministers, um, uh, which is often a formidable machine uh, to tell them about the reality of devolution. And of course, it is my job, it is a job of ministers in the Welsh Assembly, it's the job of Northern Irish ministers uh, to make it very clear to the, the UK government ministers the reality of devolution. I mean, there are other elements in this too. You know, the voice of Gibraltar needs to be heard. The voice of London needs to be heard. You know, there, there are uh, counterweights to the UK government and substantial counterweights to the UK government that are saying similar things to the things we are saying. Thank you very much, Richard Lockhead. Hey, good morning to... Michael Russell and Frank Strang, two people I worked very closely with for many years, so of course I'll be very friendly in terms of my questions today. I just want to pick up on Emma Harper's theme of clearing up some of the confusion and demystifying the whole debate around the potential impact for Scotland of being outside of the EU, and at the same time return to Michael Russell's reference to the debate earlier this week where I raised the issue of the customs union. And I think I heard Lewis MacDonald say that you can be in the single market, but not necessarily in the customs union. Therefore, and he's nodding, and therefore the debate has largely been around the single market. But is it not the case that the real economic impact for many businesses in Scotland would come from leaving the customs union? And therefore that has to be much more prominent in the debate over the potential consequences uh, for Scotland? That, that's my first question. 
I, I agree. I mean, you, you know, to, 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 to pay tribute to Richard Lockhead, he knows more about European negotiation than, than anybody else in this room and has more experience of it. And, you know, I think his point is an absolutely accurate one. Um, the, cust the, the absence of a customs union would be more problematic for most Scottish businesses than anything else. I, I won't say more problematic than the lack of existence of the single market, because I think there are uh, whole sectors for whom the single market is absolutely vital. But the customs union will impinge upon any, or any business or organisation. Um, so yes, I think that's true. But to, 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 to follow up on the, uh, Emma Harper's point, if we're going to demystify this, it's, we have to do it uh, as well as we can. And it's hard enough to explain why the single market is important. When you get into the customs union, it becomes sometimes Byzantine in its, its complexity. But yes, you're right. And we need to find a way to do it. Isn't it also the case that if Liam Fox is uh, globetrotting, trying to investigate whether or not other trade agreements are possible with non-EU countries, he's therefore ruling out being part of the customs union because you can't both allow the EU to negotiate with third parties but at the same time have bilateral negotiations with third parties around the world. Therefore, the logical conclusion is the UK government are heading for hard Brexit and to leave the customs union. Uh, you are right. Indeed, the, the existence of his department tells you, uh, you know, unless they the department was set up without a full knowledge of the implication uh, that they are not interested in the customs union, because you can't have a department of world trade if you're in an existing customs union which uh, has a, a, a set of agreed tariffs. Uh, it just can't be done. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think we are at present moment trying to read the runes of the situation without knowing precisely what the United Kingdom government wants to do. But those runes would indicate exactly what you're saying. So I just think it would be really good if the, and helpful if the, the Scottish Government could look at the potential impact, looking at the tariffs, the import costs that other countries uh, put in place in terms of exports from the UK. Uh, I'm told, for instance, that I think Brazil has a 17% tariff on the import of Scotch whisky. I read that somewhere, so I don't know if it's exactly the case, but I think we have to understand what the examples are around the world of potential tariffs and understand that leaving the customs union will have a, a heavy cost for, for Scottish business, so we can convey that message directly to Scottish business. There is work being done on that, and I'm happy to confirm that. There's an economic subgroup of the um, uh, Standing Council. There are a number of subgroups of the Standing Council. Uh, this features very largely in their work, and indeed I had a conversation uh, yesterday evening uh, with a senior European official about some of these matters. And next question, if that's okay, just one more, is that <clears throat> clearly it is one thing having transparency over the negotiations and a promise to involve the devolved administrations where there will be recorded meetings, albeit the minutes may not be made public because it will be between the devolved administrations UK government that perhaps take place every few weeks or month or whatever may be agreed. And then there's the real negotiations that actually take place at different levels within the European Union that will be taking place between the UK government and the European Union. And some of those negotiations will be formal and some will be informal. And given that we've just seen the UK fishing minister, George Eustace, say publicly that he could foresee fishing being a good bargaining chip for those negotiations, which would have an impact in Scotland, given we've got two-thirds of the fishing industry, uh, how on earth are we going to be able to be in the loop in terms of all the informal negotiations and technical negotiations and in negotiations at official levels that take place between the UK and the EU? You, are, you know the system well. You know, you know, I remember many arguments that you had with colleagues in, your colleagues in uh, the UK about access to lunches, access to events that were taking place. I remember all that happening. You know, we will be very aware of that. I can't give you a guarantee that we're going to be in every room, obviously, because we can't do that. But we're aware of the problem that you raise. We're also aware of the problem you raise that once you establish a structure, very often it begins to get eroded around the edges by that sort of thing. So the structure has to not only be a formal structure within the JMC structure, a reformed JMC structure, there has to be a strong informal structure and a strong official supporting structure. And it is fair to say that the official contact has been very detailed in recent weeks and will continue to be so. But yes, I mean, I, I think we also have to keep our eyes very, very wide open about what is taking place.
And we don't want to be naive, Frank. I just add there, I mean, there's loads of different ways of achieving that, but it seems to me the important point is the full involvement commitment from the Prime Minister. We need to extend that beyond the Article 50 triggering, which is thinking beyond, beyond just that, le that letter of triggering as to exactly how the negotiations in practice will work. I just come in on a supplementary in that. I understand that they've, they're being set up um, uh, as well as the GMC. There's the GMC for officials. Are, are, are Scottish uh, civil servants going to be involved in those working groups? One of the yeah yes, if I may. Um, I mean, one of the principles of JMC is that it's a joint secretariat to make it work, uh, and so those those official discussions are preparing the way for the ministerial discussions. So it's part of the same thing. So we're already preparing the way for the the conversation which the uh, the first minister mentioned in her letter. So yes, there's a JMC E, which is JMC Europe. Is there going to be a JMC B for Brexit? early to say whether that's the special structure or not. Uh, the detailed discussion has been to ensure that there's an understanding of whatever it is called uh, and however it operates, it operates in a way that is favourable to agreement and oversight. Uh, and it's not simply a, a rubber stamp. I, um, I did tell David Davis a story, which I'm happy to tell you, that on one occasion when I was a member of the JMCE, I attended, and Richard Lockhead will recognise this type of thing, there were 21 UK ministers present, myself and the Welsh First Minister. You know, so it wasn't exactly an even discussion taking place. And we need to ensure that the structure does not uh, err in that direction. Will you be insisting on uh, being involved in both reserved matters and devolved matters? I mean, you mentioned devolved matters earlier, but if you look at the First Minister's five tests, social protection, for example, covers lots of areas that are reserved. So will you be asking for pa involvement in... Applying the tests to every item that's discussed, but uh, you know, I don't think we should... Uh, I, from the evidence you took last week, it's clear that if you were to look at a scenario in which more powers accrued to the Scottish Parliament as a result of this, those would not necessarily solely be in devolved, present devolved areas. You know, there are examples in other parts of the world where uh, other powers exist. So our interest, while it will be first and foremost in protecting Scotland's interests in its present devolved competencies, will not solely be in that started having that discussion, have you warned them that this is where this, this, this uh, process could lead? I'm not sure lead? warning people is the best start to negotiation. <laughs> uh, but, Advise uh, them then. Well, rather. I certainly think we've made it clear that, you know, where our interests lie, and we will continue to do so. Yeah. Lewis McDonald. Yeah, I was wanting to follow the line of questioning around the customs union a little bit, because I think that comes back to uh, the issues I'd asked earlier. I think you said to Richard Lockhead that explaining the customs union and its implications was, was terribly Byzantine and, and more difficult than you mentioned earlier. I think there are 120 bilateral agreements between Switzerland and the European Union on trading matters. Information. You shouldn't do your, your, your committee advisor out of a job, however. I, I, wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't want to do that. But, but, but in addition to those many bilateral relationships that Switzerland has, clearly Norway and Iceland, as they are out with the customs union, they also have additional um, uh, agreements and, and, and economic pressures. Some would say, for example, that the Norwegian seafood industry has largely relocated to Scotland in order to be within the customs union provided by the European Union, and that's, that's clearly an economic benefit we would want to, to retain. I, I, I wonder, though, if I can come back to my earlier question about whether the single market is the sole focus of the Scottish Government's attention. Or, or whether indeed the, you, all, you, you again appear to imply that the customs union, as well as being more difficult to explain, might be uh, in some respects more important. No, I, I wouldn't give you a hierarchy of those things. I wouldn't want to give the impression that the single market is the sole focus of attention. But I have emphasised the importance of the single market, and I think I should also rightly emphasise the importance of the customs union. These are, you know, these are the existing fabric of our relationships. These are what allow us to operate within the European Union. They are what we present to the world you know, in terms of our trading and other relationships. It is very, very problematic to redraw those. Nobody, I don't think even the most enthusiastic Brexiteer would deny it, will be problematic to redraw those. And it is right that we point that out. It's also right that we, we look at alternatives as we believe they exist and how they present themselves to us. But I don't think we're in a position, we can apply the five tests, we can understand the situation, but I don't think we're in a position to draw conclusions on that as yet. 
Would it then be fair to say, uh, or, or, or not fair, and I'm, I'm, I'm open to either answer in, in a sense, uh, while, it's, while, while you've rightly criticised the UK government for being very unclear about its objectives, would it be fair to say that you are yet at an early stage yourselves in terms of drawing up what the Scottish government's objectives are in those discussions with UK ministers? Much clearer about what we want to see. I mean, I, I don't think there's any dubiety about what we want to see. So I don't think we lack clarity. Um, certainly, developing those positions in detail is, is the work of the moment, and that's what's going on. Uh, you know, we don't see any clarity from the UK government. You know, David Davis says one day that it's not likely we'll put the single market, and then he is slapped down. You know, uh, Boris Johnson makes an extraordinary remark that trading you know, relationships will be fine because we drink 300 million bottles of Prosecco, you know, and somebody else then doesn't deny the figure but denies the assertion. It, it's all very confusing. We are clear. You know, we think the best solution would have been to remain. Uh, we are clear that the single market is extremely important to us. We've explained in detail why that is. I've given you further examples here today. Uh, you know, we are absolutely clear that the, the absence of a customs union would be problematic. Uh, you know, and we are, I have also spoken you know, in each of the debates about the sectoral interests. We talked about problems and issues in, in rural economy. I'm very much looking forward to getting on to higher education, an area I know particularly well, and on to the environment, you know, which is very, very close to my heart. I think in both of those areas, it is very important that we talk in detail about it. Gail Ross uh, contributed to the debate on, on Tuesday with some very important information about the impact, the higher education research impact within her own uh, constituency. I can do that in my constituency, but you know, the Scottish Government will do it across Scotland. So all those things are within our purview and we are talking about them. Now, you know, the, if you look at Horizon 2020, for example, there are countries that contribute to Horizon 2020 by paying into the pot. You know, and, and that might be an option. But actually, that doesn't take care of a whole range of issues to do with free movement of labour, which is vitally as, as important for higher education as for actually for any other sector uh, within, within our economy. So we have those things to talk about. So I think we're being clear. I think we're developing that position. We are talking about our principles. You know, I mean, I would love to see you know, these principles articulated by the UK government, but we're talking about our principles. Uh, we're preparing our position on the negotiating machinery and urging others to move in, you know, as fast as we are moving. So I, I don't think we are failing to articulate what we're doing. And the First Minister has been very clear over the summer when others have said nothing. In terms of reaching conclusions on these options, clearly that's, as you, you've described, as work that's, that's ongoing at the moment. One of the issues that's been raised in the committee is around the capacity of well, indeed, the capacity of both the UK government to trade, to negotiate international trade, but also around the capacity of the Scottish government to support the work that you've described. Uh, we've had a reply this week, um, the conveners had a reply this week from the head of the Department of External Affairs explaining what, your, what the staffing complement of that department is, but also that those staff are also supporting the First Minister, uh, Fiona Hisdop, Alistair Allen, as well as yourself, and, and, and working with other departments. Do you feel that you have the capacity in place uh, to develop uh, deliverable options uh, from the complex of issues that, that you've described today? Yes. Um, I'll ask Frank to say a word or two about this in a minute. He's you know, at the sharp end of it. But uh, it's very true that the people working with me are also working on a wider sphere. I think that's very health helpful. From the very beginning, I've seen my job as not building an empire or a department, but building a team and a team that can support the negotiations that we're going to undertake, so it's flexible. Uh, you know, a lot of the people I talk to on a regular basis are involved in other parts of the Scottish Government's work, and that is their strength, because they have the expertise in those areas that we need to draw on. Uh, the smaller and more flexible team that we, we've been working and building uh, will have that capability, and has that capability, but we are also open to bringing people in as we need them. You know, and we're looking at that. We're also getting a lot of help from the Standing Council, we're getting a lot of help from organisations, individuals who want to talk. I mean, I, I am involved in a detailed series of meetings with all sorts of people who want to sit down and talk about what they can bring to the table and how they can help or what they think about. And uh, you know, even at my constituency surgeries, I see people who want to come along and talk about this. So I think there's an enormous engagement 
and I think that the resources of Scotland are being used efficiently and effectively to so, so do. But Frank is at the sharp yeah, end of it. Yes, yeah, I'll just add a little bit to what um, we said at the away day when we had a discussion in the summer. Um, there's lots of unknowns on all of this, but what we do know is it's pretty serious and, uh, for Scotland and that we need to take it very seriously. Uh, I talked to you about um, before about how within um, our part of the Scottish Government there's been a the directorate that, that I'm part of is now focused entirely on external affairs as opposed to having culture and other aspects to it. How the team has the team has increased to the to the number 56 that you have of people who are actually focusing on external affairs matters within Scotland and doesn't it doesn't include people overseas there are as well um, and, and the number is increasing I would say where to new functions like a uh, really important function around this demystifying the intelligence the intelligence and briefing function alongside spice trying to get that the, the information uh, uh, a function obviously around supporting the standing council because the standing council can only operate if it's very well supported um, and then an important function around project management because this is a big project and needs to be very well coordinated so those are the kind of growing growing functions i would say um, but the really important point as the minister said is that we're doing it with others uh, we can't you know it has to be the whole government effort particularly alongside our, our UK relations colleagues, because that's where the action is, as we've discussed in negotiations with the UK. But um, we've also put in place governance structures to make sure the whole organisation is part of this. We've, there's a cabinet subcommittee, as you will know, a project board to make, to make sure we've got good governance. And very importantly, engagement with all those parts of the government, the directorates, in an informal way on policy as to how, they, how can we equip them to do their business with whatever stakeholders are out there who need to be part of the story. So it's a big team effort. And we're giving a, you know, there's a visible sign of that in the debates we're having. You know, cabinet secretary leading me, summing up, uh, working with each of the cabinet secretaries and with all the other ministers. Last Wednesday, I did a stakeholders event on energy with Paul Wheelhouse. I've done a recent event with Fergus Ewing. We've had the debates. These are you know, moving on. I'm going, I've got engagements in Brussels with Fiona Hislop uh, in October. There's a whole range of events going on. So it is a collaborative activity between ministers and also across the civil service. As a supplementary to that, you mentioned higher education. Um, this committee has had a call for evidence and obviously educational organisations have responded to um, uh, and we have also taken oral evidence from them and obviously it's an absolute key sector that's affected by this. Uh, how specifically are you going to represent their interests in your negotiations with the UK government? With vigour, I have to say. Um, I think it's very important that the higher education sector in Scotland speaks with a united voice, and I think they will. I think, uh, like all sectors, I think they have to be very clear about what the impact is upon them and be prepared to articulate that. Um, and I think, of course, they have to look at the ways and the things they need in order to minimise the potential damage that will be done. One of the differentiations I drew yesterday when speaking to Japanese businesses about this was this one, and I think it's quite important in every sector. You can talk about the positive benefits, and I'm happy to hear that evidence if it exists, uh, and if that evidence exists and we can assist people with the positive benefits, we will do so. There is no doubt about that. But I suppose the, the minimum we can do for others is to try and make sure that they, they are not disadvantaged. So that is probably the first objective, to find means by which that can happen. It may be very difficult in some areas. And only then might we be able to see if there are other things that can be done to, to assist them. So we're applying that matrix everywhere, and we'll apply it to higher education. But higher education needs to be very clear about what it believes will happen and what re resolution to it it wishes to have. And I am having those discussions with a, you know, a range of people that I know within the sector. Thank you very much. I think we have a supplementary from Rachel Hamilton, do we? Well, it's not a supplementary convener, but it is about devolved competencies, okay. which um, Sir Michael, uh, sorry, not Sir Michael Keating, Professor Michael Keating, I've elevated your status, has been uh, ably guiding us through or trying to guide us through. Um, EU law will cease to apply in Scotland um, and the rest of the UK, uh, subject to the terms of our future relationship with the EU. Um, the Scotland Act 1998 as amended in 2012-2016 gives Scottish ministers powers to make legislation in areas of devolved competences. It appears that EU le legislation works for Scotland in some ways and not in others. I was wondering how you were going to uh, go about starting to unpick the legislative competences um, that we currently have um, in the best interest of Scotland and possibly shadow some of the EU legislation that we currently uh, works for us. Okay, good question, might I say. Um, 
this is an example of, of real and concrete differentiation. There is a different legal system in Scotland. So whatever happens, there will be a differentiated solution on this issue. So those that are looking at differentiated solutions might want to start thinking about that. Now, we know from <coughs> the initial response <coughs> from the Faculty of Advocates that they are very concerned about the capability of uh, the Scottish institutions uh, to uh, retranspose the legislation, to take this massive legislation and to bring it back home. Some of those things you couldn't do that with. You know, you're not going to take the, the, the common agricultural payment system and simply say we're carrying on with it, because that would be impossible. So you'll have to have a new set of rules and regulations. Other things, you can certainly assume that for a period of time, we would continue to have those in place until we got round to unpicking them. But, you know, if we started today, you know, if we were to set the task today for every member of this committee to, to, to look through the statutes and work out how we would deal with each one, we wouldn't be finished, you know, within the two years of Article 50. So we are going to have to take as read quite a lot of information and prioritise the changes that bring about, we bring about. And that's going to be a big burden on the Scottish legal system, and it's going to be a big burden on this parliament. It's one of the things perhaps we should start to think about. Were you to get to that stage, and we're not saying automatically we will get to that stage, but were you to get to that stage, there might be you know, a huge legislative burden to, to, to be dealt with by a parliament of 129 members. And you know, on previous occasions, there have been two justice committees in this parliament because too much legislation was going through. Uh, you know, I think you ain't seen nothing yet. So scoping that is the first issue, working out how it can be done, and then prioritising what is going to be done, but acknowledging this is a differentiated solution. And the solution that will apply south of the border will not be the solution that applies here because of the differences in Scots law. Thank you very much. Um, when the First Minister was before the committee a couple of weeks ago, she said that um, the Scottish Government was um, paying very close attention to the various legal challenges uh, in terms of the triggering of Article 50 and the involvement of Parliament. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware um, of the skeleton argument presented by the claimants challenging the government's ability to trigger Article 50. It's been analysed um, by our advisor, Shona Douglas-Scott, and that analysis is on the committee's website today. And basically, she outlines how the skeleton argument of the claimants uh, actually Part of it is based on the devolution settlement and indeed the Act of Union um, because the argument is that the, um, leaving the EU will affect Scotland's private law and private law is uh, protected by the Act of Union. I wondered if you had had the opportunity to um, reflect on that. Uh, yes, and I echo what the First Minister says. We are keeping a close eye on the legal proceedings that are taking place both in London and in Belfast. Uh, it is important that we understand uh, them as they proceed. Uh, the Scottish Government is, uh, I think, sympathetic to the view, very sympathetic to the view that this should be a parliamentary process and that the prerogative should not be used. Um, and I think that would gain widespread support across the Parliament. Uh, but uh, you know, we will obviously consider at each stage of the proceedings what our appropriate reaction is. And you know, at the moment, uh, that's all we are able to do. But uh, you know, it will be a developing situation, and uh, no doubt you'll want to ask me or the First Minister that question again as the cases proceed. Thank you. And uh, finally, um, you'll be aware, obviously, it's obviously been raised in, in debates on, on several occasions. Um, by Conservative members of the, the committee um, on some of the evidence that we took in, in Brussels, uh, the advice that we were given relating to Scotland's ability to speak to EU institutions as this process um, continues. And the advice that we were given, which has been repeated by several Conservative members, is that if we act in good faith in our negotiations with the UK government, uh, and the UK government indicates to Europe that they are happy with us to have our own discussions, then it can go ahead. Um, but the shutters will come down, I think was the phrase, if it was seen that you know we, we, we didn't have the UK's government's permission, if you like, to speak directly to Europe. My reflection, and I think I, I, re, I raised this publicly, is that surely the impetus is now on the UK government to say, yes, you've acted in good faith, 
you can go ahead and uh, have these direct discussions with Europe about possibilities for Scotland's differentiated relationship. Do you see any possibility of the UK government giving them that indication to you? I, I, I can only say that I am entering into these negotiations on behalf of the Scottish government in good faith. Uh, you know, um, I hope they understand that. Um, I hope that their judgment is sound and that they can see that. And in those circumstances, I can't imagine there is any problem. You know, I, I do think it's perhaps slightly over-exaggerating the influence of the UK government to say that whenever they say to a shutter in Europe, come down, it comes down. Yeah? But the reality is the Scottish government is entering into these discussions in good faith. I hope you've seen today a great deal of hard work is being done by officials, by volunteers, by people contributing across the board, uh, and we're going in intending to get the best deal for Scotland. Uh, I hope that message gets to the UK government. I certainly hope it gets across Europe, and indeed it is a message even more widely than that. Thank you very much, Mr Russell and Thank Mr you. Strang. Thank you. Uh, we'll now have a short suspension before we move to the next item of business.
the unexpected. <laughs> and uh, uh, welcome back to the European and External Relations Committee. Um, I'd like, to, given that there has been a short delay, um, the um, Ambassador of uh, Slovakia has been slightly delayed, and therefore like to ask members' uh, agreement to take item three. Uh, ahead of item two. Are we agreed on that? Agreed. Yeah, thank you. Um, item three is consideration of EU strategy. In light of the EU referendum result, I wrote to conveners, seeking, conveners of other committees seeking their views on updating the EU strategy and the role of the Parliament's EU reporters. Uh, clerks have prepared some background information, including a list of EU reporters who have been appointed to date and the responses received thus far from the conveners of other committees as to their approach to this whole subject. And you will see that in paragraph 8 of paper 4, the clerks have set out some proposals for strengthening the EU strategy of the Parliament and developing the role of reporters. So basically we are seeking members' agreement on uh, some of the suggestions that the clerks have put forward. Would anyone like to go first? Stuart McMillan. No, thank you, Convener. Um, in the last session, uh, I was uh, an EU reporter for the Local Government and Regeneration uh, Committee. Uh, and the, the thing that I, I found about it, about the role, was uh, depending on the importance that each committee uh, actually placed upon the EU reporter role, then certainly determined how active uh, the EU reporter actually was going to be. Uh, as well as also the, the actual genuine interest that the, the individual who was the EU reporter actually had as well. Uh, now I, I personally thought that, uh, that the, the EU reporter role was useful, I thought it was helpful, and uh, I certainly tried to use that position uh, to help uh, further engage the Local Government Regeneration Committee with the EU issues. So I certainly think it's a role that, that, uh, that is uh, it's very important. I think it has been maybe kind of under, uh, under thought of, really, uh, certainly in the past session, uh, and uh, I generally would, uh, would recommend that to the, in, anyone who does become a EU reporter uh, in any of the committees certainly fully engages uh, with the role, and, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to see that the, the role is going to be uh, it's going to be a beefed up really. I think there was, in terms of the responses from the various committee conveners, there did seem to be an understanding across the committees that the role of the EU reporter did need to change and that um, the implications of leaving the EU really should be part of that role. It's common sense, really, isn't it? Uh, Lewis, did you want to come in on that? Well, simply to say that uh, I think it's a useful exercise to have undertaken. I think the proposal makes, makes good sense. Mm -hmm. And it's striking one committee's even appointed two reporters, which that, I think yeah. is a, a, a measure of uh, an understanding across the Parliament that, that this is going to be important across portfolios. So yes. I think the right approach is in the paper. Okay. Emma Harper. I just noticed on page seven on Annex C it has Mike Rumbles listed as the rural economy reporter. Yes. But I think was there not a did they not have a I guess a was that approved, is that finaled? I don't know. That would be a matter for the committee. Okay. Um, I'm just this is what they've told Okay, right. This is what they've told us. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think in terms of um, this committee's work, um, in terms of coordinating uh, the response across the Parliament uh, to the process of uh, uh, leaving the EU, it would be very useful to have this reporters that, that, we, that could liaise with this committee. Uh, to keep us fully updated, because other committees, you know, they have other, they have legislative scrutiny, they have, you know, quite a burden of work. Uh, so some of them are taking on more scrutiny uh, than other committees in terms of specifically of Brexit. Um, I was quite pleased to see, for example, the, the local government committee is actually going to get uh, uh, local authorities in to give evidence. I think that will be very useful, and I'm be, um, looking forward to seeing what they come back with. And I believe the Economy Committee has um, has plans as, as well to take forward a, a particular uh, body of work. But I think ha having that opportunity to liaise with the reporters will be very useful for keeping up to speed with what's happening across all the committees. Uh, Stuart? Uh, I think it might uh, be useful uh, not to add to the, uh, the burden of our uh, workload, which uh, seems to be increasing uh, on a weekly basis. Um, I think it might, be, it might be useful to have even one uh, informal meeting with the EU reporters when they're all in place, uh, 
uh, uh, so, so we can have that kind of general discussion uh, with them and also to hear uh, issues that they actually have and want to bring to the table. Uh, and then, uh, after that, maybe have some type of regular um, dialogue with them, uh, something on a, on, a, on a more formal basis. I was certainly planning as, as convener um, to be to, to do that. Um, but if other members wished to participate, I know that members' times mm. under a great deal of pressure, but I don't know if other members wanted to do that. But certainly, I will keep up to uh, keep up that dialogue as convener. Okay. So, are we agreed on the proposals laid out in the paper? Okay. Great. Um, um, we'll have another short suspension until the next item of business. Thank you. Our next item of business is uh, an evidence session with the Slovakian ambassador to the UK as Slovakia holds the six-monthly rotating presidency of the European Union. And I would like to welcome to the meeting His Excellency Lubomet Rehak. Um, good, good morning. Before I move to members' questions, I'd like to give the ambassador the opportunity to make some opening remarks. Ambassador. Thank you, uh, convener, dear members of Scottish Parliament, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure and honour to join you here today, sharing with you priorities of the Slovak Presidency of the Council of the European Union, uh, highly estimating by this the mission of parliaments in keeping contact uh, dialogue uh, of executive power with citizens. The role of the parliaments in the EU policy has increased significantly after uh, uh, Lisbon Treaty has been uh, uh, adopted. Interparliamentary cooperation is also a key ingredient of accountable European Union. A uh, few words about, uh, about my country, because after 12 years of uh, EU membership, uh, Slovakia is honoured to lead the Union this semester. And the Presidency is really a milestone for us. Now we really have a good story to tell, a story that began by dream of our peoples to return to free and democratic world, a story that continued by our integration into the European family of nations, a family we are bound with by rich history, diverse cultures and common values, Indeed, back to Europe was once one of the velvet revolution's uh, principal credos in Czechoslovakia in 1989, and it was a voice of our European identity. We are proud to call the EU our home, uh, the Euro our currency, and the Schengen our area. The EU provides us with security, stability, and prosperity. And we are grateful for that because we have been, uh, we have been given uh, a lot and we do our best to contribute to common success of the European project. The consequences of the uh, United Kingdom's uh, referendum will obviously dominate the EU agenda in the coming uh, months and years, while EU member states express their regret about the outcome uh, of the referendum. There is a vital interest to have UK uh, as a close partner of the EU after its separation. Here I would like to express my uh, personal appreciation uh, of the Scottish people able to recognise the positive sides of the European Union uh, despite uh, of enormous anti-European attacks during the referendum campaign. I understand many of you will be interested in hearing from me more 
than I can uh, tell you in this regard. Uh, I believe you will understand that uh, it is not for ambassadors as civil servants uh, to comment uh, political choices of hosting state uh, or provide uh, political guidance on behind, uh, behalf of his country. Let me therefore just uh, recall certain principles that have been agreed at the June informal meeting of EU 27, uh, which remain valid. The basic principle is that uh, Article 50 of the EU treaty that provides uh, the legal basis for UK's withdrawal uh, from the EU uh, is, uh, is, is the main principle and it's up to British government to notify the European Council of the UK's intention to withdraw uh, from, uh, from the EU and that there should be no uh, negotiations uh, prior UK's notification of this fact. We also understand uh, the political uh, message that Brexit means Brexit, which is that the UK government wishes to proceed uh, with the implementation of the referendum result, so it will not trigger Article 50 uh, before the end of this year. This also means uh, it will not be triggered during the Slovak presidency, uh, and explain why I cannot go much further to avoid uh, overstepping the mandate of, uh, of the Slovak presidency of the Council. At the same time, uh, there is no intention, intention on the EU side uh, to prolong artificially uh, these processes. On the contrary, uh, in the interest of reducing uncertainty and further economic damage, there is willingness uh, to proceed uh, ex expeditiously. British and European citizens uh, deserve to know what exactly does Brexit mean for their lives and any artificial prolongation of uncertainty will create space for further disinformation, political destabilization, social and even xenophobic tensions and economic problems on both sides. In the meantime, the EU member states cannot stay, uh, stand idle. Self-reflection has become a must, not an option. Vox Populi, expressed in uh, British referendum, has been clearly heard reflecting worries of many Europeans, not only uh, British. The Bratislava informal EU 27 summit held on 16th of September was a first step in this regard. The aim of the summit was uh, to diagnose the present state of the Union facing withdrawal of one of its uh, most important members and to discuss uh, the approach to our common future beyond Brexit. Three key areas have been defined in the Bratislava roadmap, where significant process uh, needs to be made urgently. The first is uh, migration and external borders. Second is security, both internal and external. And third is economic and social development and, uh, and problems of uh, youth. It has also been agreed that Bratislava is just the beginning of this reflection process. The process will lead through Valletta during the upcoming, uh, upcoming Maltese uh, presidency towards Rome, where we will celebrate uh, the 60th anniversary of the treaties of uh, Rome establishing uh, European integration. Uh, and it will round off the process launched in Bratislava and set out orientation for our common future together. The Slovak presidency uh, naturally doesn't have uh, a prescription for all current uh, European problems, but we want to be both pragmatic and realistic while leading the Union this semester. To achieve a visible contribution to ongoing processes, we have four ambitions set for the Presidency. First is to make European economy stronger. Second is to modernize and broaden the single market in areas such as energy and the digital economy. Third is to work towards sustainable migration and asylum policy. And fourth is to pay attention to our external environment, namely trade deals and enlargement policy. Let me start with European economy. We will support uh, the environment favorable to investment, further economic growth and job creations. For that to happen, we will work on the deepening of the economic and monetary union and banking union. Building the capital markets union will be also in our focus. During our presidency, we will deal with the mid-term review of the multiannual financial framework and the budget uh, of the union for 2017. 
they both must better reflect uh, EU priorities and capabilities to help resolve latest challenges. There is no doubt that the single market is a success story. Four freedoms represent an excellent example of very concrete benefits of the EU for its citizens and for national economies as well. But in order to keep up with global technological advancement, the single market needs implementation of uh, two new pillars, the digital single market and the energy union. Free movement of data has the unique potential to remove barriers and create new opportunities for businesses and uh, for citizens. Our presidency welcomes uh, the adoption of uh, digital single market package uh, of 25th of May and now we will work on its implementation. The energy union can contribute to secure supplies of clean energy at affordable prices for industry and citizens. To achieve this goal, our presidency is ready to work on further enhancing diversification of resources, suppliers and transit routes, strengthening also energy interconnectivity of member states. The Energy Union project, by the way, is led by Slovak member of the European Commission, Commission's Vice President uh, Maro Ševčovic. No surprise, a sustainable migration and asylum policy uh, will belong to our top priorities and they will remain urgent issues, not only during our presidency, but also in years to come. Moreover, it is not uh, just some EU disease. Uh, this is a global problem indeed. Large-scale involuntary migration will be the most likely global risk uh, for the dec decades to come. We can help resolve it only through joint EU-wide efforts in coordination with our global stakeholders. For this purpose, the Slovak Presidency promotes uh, comprehensive and sustainable solutions, linking up all relevant in internal and external aspects. We must return to a proper functioning of Schengen area. We know that uh, uh, European border and coast guards will soon become operational. We will also support initiatives such as small borders package and the effective cooperation with the third countries, both of origin and of transit of migrants. Speaking of asylum policy alone, uh, let's not arrow, uh, narrow it to a single initiative, the distribution of refugees under the Dublin regulation uh, that Slovakia has criticized uh, for its uh, unsustainability. What we need is a comprehensive common European asylum uh, uh, system reform package. Uh, EU is working on this issue and we are ready to contribute to its urgent implementation. Besides that, legal migration should be an instrument to attract highly qualified experts from third countries, wherever they are needed for our growing economies to complement existing free movement of workers within the EU. We want the Union to be a strong global player. Our external partners expect us to continue our high-level engagement in global affairs. Therefore, we must continue to pay attention to our external environment. I speak particularly of trade agreements and enlargement policy. We believe free trade is a significant contributor to internal and external stability of the EU. Facing these agreements of some uh, members, Slovakia is convinced that the transatlantic uh, trade and investment partnership would have positive impact on EU's growth, employment and overall well-being of citizens. So we stay ready to support the EU Commission to reach a balanced agreement while safeguarding the high level of EU standards. Equally, we support an early approval of CETA agreement with Canada that we have reiterated a week ago at, uh, at Bratislava informal uh, Foreign Affairs Council in trade formation meeting. Our presidency is ready to work on the implementation of new European Global Strategy for Common uh, Foreign and Security Policy. At the same time, we will remain a vocal advocate of more uh, effective and preventive European neighbourhood uh, policy. To the East, uh, we wish to make strong emphasis on stabilisation and reform processes, and to the South, we would like to focus inter alia on countries uh, causing massive migration flows to Europe. We will also try to ensure the credibility of enlargement policy. Given our own experience, the enlargement policy is one of the most effective transformation tools. 
It is thus a key instrument for stabilizing our neighborhood. We want to actively communicate that the path towards the EU leads via doing own homework. And in the end, I would like to stress then, in pursuing our presidency priorities, Slovakia will continue to be uh, an honest and fair bro broker, like it should be. Uh, now I am ready to hear your comments and ask some questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Your Excellency. And we have a number of members who would like to ask questions. Um, can I say how uh, pleasing it is to have Slovakia uh, in Scotland this week, and I learned a lot about your country at the reception that you had um, in Edinburgh last night. It was extremely interesting. Can I start by asking you what the Slovakian presidency um, has, ha what effect the Slovakian presidency has had on Slovakia's relationships with other member states in the European Union? Could you please uh, <clears throat> reformulate the question? Yes. If, yeah, yeah. What, what has the effect of the Slovakian presidency been on your relationship with other member states in the European Union? How have you benefited from holding the presidency? The presidency is, uh, is important uh, for, for any member state, and uh, that's why the prince rotating principle was established, in order that uh, every uh, bigger or smaller member state, bigger or smaller economy uh, have a chance uh, to rule the organization or to, uh, to, to drive, uh, uh, drive it through a certain period of time, which is a uh, half a year. Uh, and uh, this is the principle of uh, equality in, in, uh, in EU. Uh, for Slovakia, it is an excellent opportunity really to, to uh, focus attention on, uh, on uh, topics that are important uh, to us, but it's also a, a, a enormous, uh, enormously positive uh, uh, tool of visibility uh, of the country, and we are using all those uh, informal meetings in, in Slovakia. Uh, we have uh, over 200 uh, uh, meetings of EU formations in Bratislava with uh, roughly 20,000 participants coming to Slovakia this semester. And uh, diplomatic missions on Slovakia are doing a, a big, uh, big uh, be, uh, promotion of Slovakia uh, abroad. And uh, that, was, that was the reason when uh, I was invited uh, to this esteemed committee that I decided to stay all the week, uh, all the working week in, in Scotland and uh, meeting uh, not only uh, members of Scottish Parliament, uh, but uh, also uh, uh, executive uh, power, uh, business across uh, universities. I, I'm dis uh, have, having discussions in four uh, Scottish universities. Uh, and uh, local authorities as well, because we uh, need uh, also this specific uh, uh, example of uh, a case of uh, United Kingdom uh, uh, having its um, having in mind current developments in the relationship with the European <coughs> Union that uh, we need deeper expertise in in uh, this. But everywhere we are promoting very much uh, our uh, small but uh, very uh, nice and and uh, positive and progressive country. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Richard Lockhead. Good morning, Ambassador, uh, and thank you for your evidence and explaining the benefits from the perspective of the Slovakian people of being a member of the European family of nations. Clearly, Brexit is going to dominate a lot of your government's thinking throughout the duration of the presidency and, and beyond. And I noticed that in the Financial Times a couple of weeks ago, that your Prime Minister said that the European Union will make sure that leaving the Europe that will make sure that the UK leaving the European Union is very painful for the UK. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate and define the kind of pain you think will be caused to the UK by leaving the EU. Thank you for this uh, question. Definitely, uh, it's not up to Ambassador to, to comment uh, his Prime Minister's uh, statements and interviews. Uh, however, uh, I'm of the opinion that uh, 
what he expressed in open and sincere way is uh, exactly that what uh, European leaders uh, are worried about. Uh, in uh, our political culture, if you uh, allow me to philosophy a little bit, uh, we got uh, accustomed to, to excessive use of uh, constructive ambiguity uh, in our statements. And uh, our citizens stopped to understand uh, what, uh, what uh, uh, political representatives have in mind. So that was an um, appeal uh, in, in Bratislava, where, where leaders of the EU have met in, in, in September, to, to speak to speak, and I, now I quote, we should inject more clarity into our decisions, use clear and honest language, focus on citizens' expectations, with strong courage to challenge simplistic solutions of extremist or populist political forces. This is what, uh, what uh, politicians have in mind when they try to explain in, in clear words uh, uh, where, is, uh, where is the uh, problem. Uh, and. Uh, it would be really naive to think that such a complex issue as uh, disengagement of uh, a big uh, member state of the Union uh, could be an easy uh, exercise. Uh, it will definitely link, uh, require long and tough negotiations uh, to, to agree on a mutually acceptable uh, deal. Uh, and um, he mentioned, uh, uh, he mentioned this, uh, this uh, uh, pain in order to, to, to understand better, uh, probably, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, it, is, it is really a complex problem uh, that, will, uh, that will require a lot of uh, negotiations and uh, citizens must be aware that it will be uh, uh, difficult and uh, that uh, um, hold the Europe, not only the United Kingdom, uh, will, uh, in certain uh, level, uh, suffer from this. And, and clearly, because Scotland voted to remain within the EU, any likelihood, as we expect it to be the case, that the EU makes it very difficult for countries to leave the EU without a great deal of pain uh, is understandably going to cause concern of the impact in, in Scotland. And the Scottish Government, as you're aware, are pursuing options to find out if it's possible for Scotland to maintain a relationship with Europe, particularly as a member of the single market. If the UK Government were to give the go-ahead to Scotland to explore those options in a proper manner, i.e. to have negotiations with member states and the European institutions. Is that something you think the Slovakian government and presidency would support? It, in my opinion, it's too early to speculate about this uh, question because we, we are not aware even about the basic parameters of, uh, of uh, British exit from the European Union. So we now really need to wait uh, for, for oops, it's, is it working? Yeah. Uh, for, uh, for, for British government to formulate uh, its uh, negotiation uh, position that will be then uh, considered in, uh, in a circle of 27 member, member states and their uh, negotiator. Uh, I cannot, uh, cannot give any promise on behalf of one government uh, because it will be a consensual uh, act of, uh, of uh, negotiations uh, that will bring to, uh, to this result. It would be simply not, not serious to, to answer this. And I guess my last question, just is in terms of that timescale for understanding what the UK government's position is on the negotiations and all its different aspects, does the Slovakian presidency or government have a, a view on what that timescale should be to finally get some kind of indication from the UK government of its negotiation positions? Mm, uh, we were ready, and uh, in fact, uh, we adopted the Slovak presidency programme only after referendum. 
we waited for for, for referendum uh, in order to to be actual and to uh, to declare in presidency priorities if we will either implement uh, the February agreement of uh, David Cameron's uh, government with with EU uh, or we will we will need to tackle new a new question of British British exit from the European Union. So we expressed our readiness to to start this process, and uh, uh, now it's really. The the the, pros, the ball is on side of uh, of uh, British government that we expect that will come uh, with triggering Article 50 and start the official uh, negotiations. From our, our part, uh, we are we are ready for uh, for negotiations. Very much, Your Excellency. Can I just advise you that your microphone works automatically, so you don't need to worry about the button that, that works automatically. Uh, Lewis Macdonald. Thank you very much, and uh, may I start with a. I hope a more factual uh, question, but one that perhaps will lead on to uh, a slightly more political one. <clears throat> Didi Asuv has been appointed to represent the, Pres the Council of the European Union in the negotiations, Michel Barnier for the Commission uh, and Guy Verhofstadt for the European Parliament. What, from the perspective of the Presidency, how do you see the roles of the three uh, uh, individuals I've mentioned? How will the Presidency relate to each of those three parties to the negotiations with the UK? Uh, every uh, European institution uh, nominated uh, its representative. It means that uh, every institution wants to be involved in, in the processes. Uh, now the process where once uh, British government uh, uh, officially notifies European Union about its interest to, to leave the organization and trigger uh, Article 50. Uh, European Council will need to, to uh, convene and to nominate, uh, nominate uh, the body that will hold the negotiations. Uh, in, uh, it's, it's not decided uh, which body it will be, but, uh, but uh, for this kind of uh, operations, uh, United, uh, European Union uh, has a technical uh, organism, which is European Commission, that has full expertise uh, for holding practical uh, negotiations. But uh, uh, heads of uh, states and governments already declared that they'd, they want to, to uh, uh, keep uh, 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 control over the process, so th there will be found mechanism how to how to be involved uh, also in these processes. And the European Parliament is is, is the same. And as uh, every process needs some supervisor, they nominated this uh, the three person to to uh, to be there. Is, is it your expectation to to, to to allow me to understand? Um, does that mean that Michel Barnier? will lead the negotiations, or does it mean that he will lead on the day-to-day -day negotiations and then report back to the Council as well as the Commission? Uh, he should be negotiator for the Commission. Yes, so uh, his budget for reporting will be, will be Commission, but it's, uh, uh, it's up to decision of the Council. So now we, we need to, uh, to uh, wait for formal notification of British government and then uh, the European uh, Council will decide on, on uh, further procedures in this regard. So, so it's not yet settled in a sense no. as to what the, No, no, it's not, be. not agreed because it would be preliminary. We, we don't know really even parameters okay. of, uh, of uh, British exit okay. from the uh, Union. That, that, that's, that's helpful. <clears throat> one, one of the issues perhaps from your perspective uh, in relation <coughs> to the Slovakian government that will be interesting uh, is the statement made by the Visegrad Four around uh, freedom of movement, and clearly that includes your own government. It, it appears uh, from, from that statement that within the, although you've described areas of agreement among the 27 member states, it would appear from comments that have been made that's, that, that some member states have stronger views on certain aspects of the potential negotiations than others. And it would be a, a, a reasonable assumption that a public statement around freedom of movement by Slovakia and its neighbours reflects concern about the potential negotiating position of the European Union in relation to that issue. C can you comment on that? Would you say that that was a fair uh, interpretation? Uh, yes, as I uh, understand it, uh, uh, 
uh, every uh, every um, political leaders and especially uh, governments express uh, their uh, their views even if uh, we really we do not react to 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 uh, to concrete uh, uh, concrete uh, parameters of, of of British exit yet but uh, there was a reaction for for commentaries of uh, British politicians who are establishing certain uh, red lines for, for future negotiations by public statements regarding, for instance, uh, the, the, the freedom of uh, movement. And uh, that, was, uh, that was the reaction to, to, uh, to these uh, statements. Uh, uh, we, we feel that, uh, that uh, mentioning issue of EU citizens living and working in the UK who are not migrants, but uh, the, the there are people using the, the, the for freedoms of the common space, uh, is, is uh, correct. They uh, have moved uh, to your country in, uh, in bona fide, uh, legally, uh, using the opportunities of uh, common market. Uh, and uh, the same ref uh, uh, re relates to British citizens uh, working in the uh, EU area. It's absolutely naturally. And uh, uh, Prime Minister, uh, express just the wish of uh, Slovakian uh, government and then also uh, in, in Visegrad a format of uh, Czech, Polish, uh, Hungarian, Slovak uh, government uh, to pay uh, adequate uh, attention to, to this problem in uh, uh, negotiations when they uh, start. And in fact, in uh, June, uh, council conclusions after, uh, after your referendum uh, uh, there is uh, written in Article 4 that access to single market requires acceptance of all four freedoms. So these are these are generally uh, agreed uh, lines of of European uh, Union in this uh, in this uh, uh, context. But would it be fair to say that the stress laid on that particular issue by the Visegrad? Uh, formation is is simply a view of four member states. It doesn't necessarily uh, bind or reflect the Slovakian presidency of the Council uh, for its period of office. Yes, uh, and uh, the, the, you are right. You are correct. Yes. Sorry, can I can I just ask a supplementary on that, just to, to clar clarify it? Is it your understanding that you that you cannot have access to the single market or be a member of the single market? without also having free movement of people? The table without one leg will be, uh, will be very liable. Uh, and uh, and th this, is the, this is the problem. We consider really that uh, you shouldn't uh, give uh, uh, or put in disadvantage uh, other uh, uh, members of the club by giving advantage to, uh, to one of them. And this is one of the uh, uh, results also of uh, of uh, heads of state meetings in in uh, Bratislava in in, in, in uh, Bratislava's roadmap, where they stated uh, uh, precisely uh, precisely this that uh, uh, we need uh, uh, we need to um, I can't find it now. Sorry, but in the in this sense, yeah. you know, the the Visegrad statement suggested that the, those four countries at least would veto any deal which uh, excluded free movement of people. Is that's your government's position, that you would veto any deal that didn't allow free movement of people? I'm just trying to, uh, to check in the in statement of uh, Visegrad if, if there is uh, that, that, uh, that the countries would uh, veto. Uh, maybe it's not, uh, not written in, in this form. Uh, but definitely it is, it is the common interest of uh, Central European countries. Uh, you know that um, our neighbours and we have a uh, dozen of thousands of uh, citizens living uh, in the UK and for us it is an ob 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 obligation to, uh, to uh, protect the rights of our uh, citizens. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Rachel Hamilton. Convener, Your Excellency. Your Prime Minister, Robert Fico, used his speech to say the European Parliament um, outlines the strength of the EU, saying it's an amazing and unique project, but he also said it's not perfect, but for which there is no alternative. 
I also read that one of your three principles is to restore citizens' confidence in the common European project. Firstly, do you think that the UK-EU referendum result has caused uncertainty amongst the remaining 27 mem member states? And are they questioning their membership of the EU? I, I tried to explain it also in my uh, introductory uh, words that uh, this is a big issue for, for the Union and uh, it was a wake-up call for, for all the Europe, the result of, uh, of, of uh, British referendum and uh, to uh, uh, following uh, how people react to, to campaigns. And then we realized that we really we do not pay enough attention to underline positive sides of European integration. Uh, all the positives are taken for granted. For, for, uh, especially for younger generation. Uh, they, they do not think about uh, uh, the need for passport when they go to, to, to neighboring uh, country because they simply do not, uh, don't, don't need it. Yeah? And uh, uh, we, from time to time, uh, need uh, to, uh, to, uh, 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 to remind it repeatedly uh, that there are advantages of, of, the, of the European uh, Union of this, uh, this project. Uh, the, the mentioning that it is not uh, perfect, definitely is not. And it uh, never can be, but it's the best pro uh, project of integration we ever had in Europe. This project is guaranteeing peace and stability in Europe for 70 years. And uh, we must be, we must underline uh, this all the time in, in public communications. Unfortunately, we uh, we are witnessing that uh, good news are no news, and nobody wants to uh, to speak about any positive aspects. Everybody is uh, uh, taking only only uh, negative experience. That happens naturally. This is a, 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 a live organism, and uh, uh, as I said, it's, it's uh, not perfect. So this is also also uh, the attitude of. Uh, uh, our presidency, and it's mirrored also in Bratislava, Bratislava declaration, this, uh, this need for sincere and open communication with citizens and to, to, to show them that, uh, that uh, uh, yes, uh, we committed in Bratislava to offer to our citizens in the upcoming months a vision of an attractive EU they can trust and support. We are confident that we have the will and capacity to achieve it. This is the, the concrete uh, message of, uh, of uh, political leaders of the EU to this question. Thank you. Um, immigration control was obviously one of the um, main reasons that a lot of people in the UK voted to leave. I'm wondering if you'd like to give your opinion on if you think that other countries are looking to reform areas of EU policy, such as immigration. As we think that it's necessary simply to, uh, to uh, reform the, the immigration system, because last year development showed uh, that, uh, that the numbers of, uh, no illegal, but irregular migrants that came to Europe uh, was, uh, was too big to, to absorb by, by, by uh, Europe, and it uh, started to threaten the security uh, of the Union, uh, its member states and individual uh, citizens. So. Uh, we need uh, really to, to use all the instruments available uh, to, to halt this process. And uh, there are many instruments. Uh, in, in fact, uh, uh, some are sh uh, short, uh, short perspective uh, uh, instruments uh, aimed at, at, aimed at uh, uh, resolution of acute problem, like was the, the, the agreement of EU with Turkey which was unbelievable before, but then uh, EU uh, could agree with Turkey mechanism uh, for, uh, for stopping uh, the, the, that uh, enormous flow uh, from Turkey uh, to, uh, to Greece uh, and to, to, to Schengen area uh, uh, through Greece. Then uh, definitely uh, instru uh, instruments of uh, foreign uh, and security policy must be involved in this, uh, in this process. We need to uh, to make uh, more efforts in, uh, in conflict countries. 
in order to stop uh, the military conflicts and uh, to, uh, to stop the, the humanitarian uh, emigration of, of, of the people from affected regions. This is very uh, Im important. Uh, and definitely, uh, we need also to do something with European asylum system because it's, uh, it was uh, 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 the, the Geneva Conventions were adopted in the 1950s, and uh, uh, today they do not reflect the, the realities of the 21st century. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Okay. Now, I have um, two members who have indicated they wish to ask a question, Stuart McMillan and Emma Harper. Is it on this particular topic? Um, not really. Right, well, I'll go to Stuart because he caught my eye first, <laughs> and okay. then Emma Harper. Yes. No, no, thank you very much. Um, good morning, Ambassador. Uh, just, well, there, was, there was one thing that you said, there were two comments that you mentioned uh, just regarding uh, well, the EU, uh, one being a wake-up call and also uh, all positives are taken for granted. Uh, but in terms of the, the EU and with the UK's decision uh, to leave uh, the, the, the EU project, um, what uh, do you, do you see that as actually being a threat to the, to the future existence of the EU? Uh, but also, uh, what opportunities do you actually see for the EU to actually reform and uh, progress and make it more, uh, and make it more realistic and tangible uh, for, the, uh, for the members and for, the, the, uh, and for those people who live within the EU? Thank you for, for your uh, question. Uh, I think that it's most, more fair if I will quote the, the declaration of, uh, of uh, head of states of EU27 that made in, in Bratislava uh, uh, that uh, particularly mentions this question that also one country has decided to leave. The EU remains indispensable for the rest of us. Uh, in the aftermath of the wars and deep divisions of our continent, the EU secured peace, democracy, and enabled our countries to prosper. Many countries and regions outside uh, still only strive for such, a, uh, such uh, achievements. We are determined to make a success of the EU's 27 member states, building on the joint history. And this is, I, I think, that generally uh, the answer, that there is a, st a strong determination of, uh, of EU uh, to, uh, to continue. Uh, as a, as a, as a uh, block and not, uh, not to be tempted uh, by ideas that uh, now one member state leaves and uh, l let's dissolve uh, the, the club because we do not have alternative uh, uh, for the EU. Um, one of the things about the, the EU uh, that uh, has been apparent uh, over the years has been uh, its flexibility uh, to actually find solutions uh, to problems that arise. Uh, uh, in terms of the, the EU uh, and the, the UK situation, but also the EU uh, and well, the situation uh, for Scotland uh, and Northern Ireland and also Gibraltar, who voted uh, very much in favour to actually remain part of the EU, uh, what is uh, your impression of any, uh, any flexibility that the EU could actually uh, adopt uh, for, the, certainly for Scotland, Northern Ireland and Gibraltar? I'm afraid I'm not competent to, to answer this question. Uh, this is a question that will be, uh, that, that is internal affair of the United Kingdom, that is a member state of, of the Union. And uh, uh, once there are some developments that uh, the EU uh, will be uh, entitled to react to, it will react, definitely. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but meanwhile, it's, in, um, it's impossible to, to speculate on uh, such uh, sensitive issues. I thought I would try. I expected you to, to say that. <laughs> uh, but uh, but one, uh, one other question, just in terms of the, the triggering of uh, Article 50 uh, and also with uh, Slovakia uh, having the presidency of the EU at the moment, um, is Slovakia's, um, would Slovakia prefer the Article 50 to be triggered uh, sooner or later? Uh, in order for uh, any further, uh, any meaningful discussions to actually take place. Yes, uh, I already tried to explain that our aim is uh, uh, to have clarity as soon as possible, because uh, because we feel that uh, that uh, markets uh, are awaiting, they they, uh, uh, they are not developing. There is nothing. Uh, 
uh, tragic uh, happened after referendum, but uh, economic circles would uh, assure you that uh, that uh, capitals are uh, awaiting for further developments. There is uh, no significant in, uh, investment because everybody is in, in waiting mood, which is detrimental for, for economies. And pro prolongation of this uh, of these uh, uncertainties uh, is uh, is detrimental to all of us. So this is this is the reason why we uh, we would uh, would like to have uh, clear vision of uh, of British partners. Uh, what kind of uh, what, what what perspective of relationship, future relationship of United Kingdom with Europe they envisage? So the lack of vision and clarity mm -hmm. is creating economic uncertainty yes. in terms of investment decisions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's that's right. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emma Harper. Thank you, thank you. Good morning, Ambassador. Um, in previous meetings, we have discussed the human aspects of Brexit and the relationships between people and the movement of people. Do you or your um, Prime Minister, Robert Fico, are you concerned that EU workers will be treated as second-class citizens during this whole Brexit process? Uh as I understood it, he, uh, Prime Minister Fico he expressed uh, uh, the, uh, the view uh, that uh, uh, the, the rights of workers could be uh, could be the topic in negotiations uh, that would uh, uh, that would potentially harm the interest of uh, of EU workers uh, in the UK and. Mm, also British workers uh, in, in other countries of, uh, of European Union. And he expressed the view that this is uh, not acceptable for, simply for, for, from our point of view, because uh, we, uh, uh, the government must take care of, uh, of uh, citizens' uh, rights. And they really didn't, uh, didn't do anything uh, which would be illegal. They are uh, legally in a space which is, uh, which is uh, legally binding for ev every government of common space to, uh, to uh, to accept. Thanks. On that topic, <clears throat> can I ask that as you are ambassador to the court of St James, have you made representations to the UK government on behalf of securing the rights of your citizens living in the UK? Uh, uh, we uh, we had. Uh, as ambassadors, a couple of meetings with uh, with UK government representatives, uh, particularly after uh, after the referendum and after the cases of uh, physical and verbal attacks uh, on on uh, uh, people from uh, European Union, uh, just after after referendum, which we understand are some leftovers of of this negative campaign uh, uh, in in uh, uh, referendum, uh, the, the race of this xenophobic. Uh, uh, Movements, but we were we were uh, uh, we were told that uh, British uh, government is following the situation uh, closely, and uh, it's uh, it's not allowing any uh, uh, any violation of uh, human rights or of laws of this country, uh, any any uh, hate crimes. Okay. In this regard. Thank you. And of course, you'll be aware that in Scotland, where we voted Remain, uh, the Parliament, uh, the First Minister, and indeed all the political leaders have been very clear that EU citizens are very welcome in Scotland and Slovakian citizens are very welcome in Scotland. Um, Ross Greer. Thanks very much. Um, Ambassador, to go back to Rachel Hamilton's question. Um, there is mention, uh, much mention from your Prime Minister around uh, repairing the holes that have been made in the Schengen area and addressing, as, as you mentioned, issues around uh, refugees and asylum seekers coming to Europe. Uh, does the, the Slovakian government distinguish between economic migrants who are, who are coming here for uh, reasons and choice uh, from refugees who are fleeing war in Syria, Somalia, Yemen, etc.? And um, the Slovakian government has uh, rejected uh, the idea of quotas to spread the number of refugees arriving across Europe. And you mentioned yourself the deal made with Turkey. Many of the refugees who arrive cannot be pushed back to Turkey because they've not arrived through Turkey. They've arrived, say, through Libya to Italy. 
What is the Slovakian government's position in regards to, to these refugees who cannot be pushed back through Turkey? Our government's stand is that uh, this is uh, this global issue, but uh, for us uh, it is a European issue and it must be resolved in a uh, European uh, way. Really, we uh, really tried to, to attract uh, the attention uh, of, of political debate uh, about this topic uh, to, to the fact that uh, uh, maybe majority uh, of, of the people who are traveling uh, irregularly to, to, uh, to the European Union are not from, uh, from uh, uh, the regions that are in war conflict, but they are, they are going uh, to Europe as, as economic migrants. And uh, we have other procedures to, to attract the working force to, uh, to Europe uh, legally, uh, legal instruments, and this is not acceptable simply. Uh, but uh, facing to this uh, massive uh, uh, migration, there was a, uh, the, 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 uh, there were uh, needed some, uh, some um, uh, uh, legal procedures uh, in, in order to stop this. Uh, one of the that was this agreement with, uh, with with Turkey because there was a big a big portion. Another is one, uh, one is through uh, Mediterranean. You are you are right. Unfortunately, we, for, for now we do not have partner on other side because uh, because Libya doesn't have uh, government. So this is the task for common foreign and security policy instruments uh, to influence uh, situation uh, in in Libya in order to have a working government and to uh, to have a possibility to create. Uh, uh, hotspots on territory of Libya, where, where these people taken on, 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 on the sea could be uh, brought to and there to start the, uh, the, the process of, uh, of uh, uh, information gathering about the, uh, the persons who are they. They are uh, really uh, uh, asylum seekers or they are economic uh, migrants. They, these are these are various. Uh, uh, Lay, uh, lay, layouts of this of this process that must be uh, must be uh, tackled. And regarding the, uh, this distribution, obligatory distribution, we are uh, we are in favor of uh, of voluntary distribution because we don't think that uh, that uh, obligatory distribution uh, can be uh, can be uh, in fact uh, realized in open space uh, in, in in space without border. Borders. If uh, somebody wishes to go to Germany, we cannot to put chain on him and uh, t tell him that you will stay in Slovakia. Unfortunately, we are not able to uh, to do it, and we stated it. Uh, we, we were accused of uh, all the sins uh, of the words uh, for uh, word for this, but uh, but this is the fact, and it is the way that population understands. There are arguments that population uh, 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 perceives uh, the clarity of of words. We could also say that uh, okay, we will accept this mechanism, and then uh, then everybody who would come, or 90% of those who would come, would immediately leave to Germany. But what for uh, to be uh, to be uh, so, so hypocritical? So this is an attempt to, to establish new uh, new form of communication with, uh, with with the population. Sometimes it's very very uh, perceived very negatively and uh, and uh, critically, particularly by media. Thanks very much. Conscious of time, do I have time for a quick follow-up, convener. Yes. Yeah. Um, is there a recognition of the concern that many Europeans have with Turkey, that a deal has been done with Turkey to push refugees back there, when in fact many refugees, particularly Kurdish refugees, flee Turkey because of the persecution they face from that government, not just from places further than Turkey, say Syria, that they fled from? That Turkey in itself is a, a nation that produces refugees because of its government's oppression. But this is not a question for the presidency. This is def uh, de definitely not among the, the, the presidency's uh, uh, priorities. Okay, very diplomatic. And um, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. You, you said this morning and, and described as one of the four ambitions for the Slovakian presidency is to deepen economic and monetary union. How do you envisage that going forward from this point? Uh, yes. Uh, I have some some more detailed information about uh, about the economy. Uh, 
aspect in particular? I are interested in monetary yeah. uh, aspect. You know. Well, uh, if if you are uh, interested in more deep uh, deeper information about this, uh, we can send you the full full information of of. Uh, Current uh, current developments in this uh, in this sphere. Uh, we just had an uh, informal uh, ECOFIN meeting a few weeks uh, of week ago in in, uh, in Bratislava. So they made some uh, some step forward in this area. That, that would be very helpful. Jean Claude Juncker two weeks ago said that yeah. it was something he hoped to be in the white paper following this presidency mm -hmm. for, for um, and yes. so it would be very useful to understand how that, yes. how that looks. Thank okay. you very much. Would you say that to the committee, we would all very much appreciate it. And can I thank Your Excellency for giving your evidence today and wish you well for the rest of your time in Scotland. Thank you very much and we will now close and go into private session. Thank you. Thank you.